أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وشفي المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين المنتجبين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب الأسر والزمان روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه كولي for the hastening of the advent of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First off, congratulations, Mubaraki, to all of you who are here tonight as we celebrate the birth of the father of our living and awaited Imam, the birth of the 11th Imam, the 11th successor of the Prophet, Imam Hassan ibn Ali al-Zaki al-Askari alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And we ask Allah to accept this act of worship from us tonight as we've gathered together to celebrate this joyous occasion. And we ask Allah to give us the ability to be able to be present in Samara, to pay respects to our 11th Imam directly, and to also have the intercession, the shafa'at of him, and his forefathers and his son, the twelfth Imam, on the day of resurrection, for the fulfillment of all our du'as, our hajat, and for the fulfillment of all of our needs. One more salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, please. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This evening, as we've gathered to mark the important birth of our eleventh Imam, and just I think a few weeks ago we had actually gathered to mark his shahadat anniversary. And so, obviously, when we look at the lives of the Ahlul Bayt, especially the 11th Imam, I don't want to repeat what I talked about that other program. But I just want to just mention one or two things before I go to my main theme for tonight. And that is, you know, when we look at the lives, and again, this is common knowledge, but just as a refresher for each and every one of us, myself included, is that when we look at the lives of the 14 infallibles, the Prophet, obviously his daughter Lady Zahra, and the 12 Imams, we see that when, when or the reason why they were brought onto earth is a very important reason. And sometimes we perhaps forget or we miss the big picture. You know, we sometimes reflect on the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt and we lament and cry over them. And sometimes when we have these gatherings to celebrate their birth anniversaries or important events in the calendar, you know, we have these joyous celebrations, and obviously both of these are acceptable. They are religious uh, obligations, we can say to an extent, to keep alive the memory of the Ahlul Bayt salam, within our own hearts, within our own families, within our own community. But ultimately, when we look at why Allah chose these individuals, and not only chose them, but why they went through difficulties, ups and downs in their life, why they went through the challenges they went through, because Allah could have easily allowed them to literally with a snap of a finger change the course of history. Meaning Karbala could have been changed by one intention from Imam Hussein. The life of all of our Imams could have been changed if they had decided to exercise an authority Allah had given to them. But they decided obviously, and Allah decides, for them to lead the natural course of life for things to happen and things to go in their own natural way. For us to realize who they are, for us to better appreciate not only who they are, but what message they came with. And for us to be able to gain inspiration from their lives. For us to realize that Allah let this natural course of events run through. Yes, Allah intervened certain times within the life of Rasulullah, but ultimately things went through a certain way also for you and I to understand our responsibilities. When we look at the life of the 11th Imam, he was under 30 when he was killed. I mean, many people in this room, you know, you're at that age already. Imagine him being the authority of Allah and being killed at a very young age. 
Some may say too early because the community may not have been ready yet for the birth of the imam's son, the, fifth, the twelfth imam. Maybe people weren't ready to be able to accept an imam of that young age, to go into an occultation in that ghayba, to be kept away from the masses. But obviously Allah does everything for His own reason. There is a rationale behind every act Allah does. And obviously the reasons maybe are hidden from us. But we do appreciate that the Imams came for a message, for guidance of humanity. And obviously that message continues throughout time. It doesn't end with the time of the Prophet. It doesn't end with the Imam. It doesn't end with the death of an Imam because it continues on. And obviously as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we accept that it goes on even during the ghaybat, the occultation of our 12th Imam. And that it will eventually obviously come to an end. But in this time, obviously, we need to go back to the lives of the infallibles to study their life, what happened, what guidance they left for us, what they want us to take out of the religion, what they want us to implement from their mission, from their message, and that this will hopefully, if we're able to take it from their teachings, that will allow you and I to continue forward in life, no matter what the difficulties arise, no matter what challenges come up. No matter how dark and gloomy the world may seem, when we go and reflect back on the teachings of Ali Muhammad, we'll realize that they have left us guidance in every aspect of their life. And so as we look at the birth of the 11th Imam tonight, I want to focus on one, again, very short hadith, one very short aspect of a teaching that he has left for us, which I personally feel, if we're able to imbibe the teachings of the Imam, if we're able to take the lesson of the 11th Imam to heart, not only this tradition, obviously this one for tonight, but all of their statements, then hopefully this will be one more step in our completing of our Iman, of perfecting of our knowledge of Allah, and that this will hopefully bring each and every one of us closer to being able to be servants and helpers of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala, Farajuhu Sharif. And so tonight I want to look at the topic from the hadith of the 11th Imam on kicking the habit, the true worth of worship, the true worth of ibadat in our lives. Obviously ibadat plays an important role in all of our lives. Worship of God plays an important role. I want to again through this hadith tonight elaborate on one aspect of worship and as the theme says of kicking the habit and I'll explain what I mean by that because Normally when you say, I'm going to kick the habit, it's something negative in our lives. You know, people who are smokers, you say, I'm going to kick the habit next month. I'm going to try to wean myself off of it. And so usually kicking the habit has a negative connotation. I'm going to try to tie that topic, that theme, into the hadith from the 11th Imam. Again, him being at the end of the lineage of the prophets and the Imams, obviously the 12th Imam being his son, but the 11th Imam being that last out of the Imams that would have a normal life. Right? He lived a normal everyday life. Just like the first 11 Imams, they didn't live extraordinary long lives like our 12th Imam. So the 12th Imam, a lot of times when we have to discuss him, we have to look at him as outside of the boundaries of natural law. And that's a fact because he's outside of time and space. I mean, how else do you and I explain living for 1,200 years to date, and obviously until Allah allows him to return. So the average, the other 11 Imams in their average lifespan, obviously they did what they could do to bring each and every of one of their followers up to a level of knowledge. So as we've talked about in the past, when Imam Ali came on the scene, he had his government for that four or five years after the death of the three Khalifas, he takes on the role of the governance, and he has that short window of opportunity to bring the community to a certain plateau, to a certain level. He's killed, the next Imam comes, he moves them higher up, and it goes on, so on and so forth, until the 11th Imam. Now the 11th Imam has obviously a unique role, because he knows his son will go into that occultation. He knows that the Shias won't have connection to the Imam directly. Like, as, as we, we can't just walk into their home today and go and talk to them. And so he had to prepare the minds of the followers in a unique way. 
And that's why even when you look at the history of how the Imam would interact with his companions, they would go to the home, as we've talked about in the past, disguised as sellers of fruits, of vegetable salesmen. And they would basically go into the home of the Imam that way, take letters to the Imam, take you know, religious dues to the Imam, get answers to questions from the Imam in a clandestine fashion. So he was preparing their minds for a change of how the system of governance would work within Islam. What I want to look at tonight in this kicking the habit, and I begin with this, is what we call the habit loop. Maybe some of you have heard of this theory or this system that governs our lives. The habit loop and how I want to relate this to the 11th Imam and him preparing you and I for the advent of our 12th Imam is that the human psyche works in a certain way. We have a cue, right? something triggers something within us. That trigger happens and we jump into routine mode. We have to do something to fulfill that cue that just took place. Once the routine is complete, a reward comes at the end. And then we go back to that trigger, whatever that cue is. You know, for some people, maybe who have a, a habit of, you know, maybe eating things they shouldn't. Maybe when you get under stress, that cue is that you go to the fridge and you grab something to eat. You grab a chocolate bar or something unhealthy, or you go and grab a smoke and you go and smoke. Your cue is that thing that's stressing you out. Right? And so the routine is you, the, the cue happens, you run to fix that problem. If it's stress, you go to the cigarette or to the chocolate bar, or maybe you go shopping. You know, some people cure their, their, their stress by going and shopping, and they get the credit card bill and they got more stress, so they get it and it goes into a circle, right? But the cue happens, you go through a routine, you get the reward, you're, you, know, you got your fixation, you're, you're set, you're calm, and then you go on with life. Sometimes this habit is okay. Right? For example, somebody who wants to get into shape. So you have a habit. Maybe you wake up two hours before Fajr and you go for a run every morning. That's your cue, your alarm goes off. And you get ready, you go out, you do your jog. Right? You've got your routine you go into. Your reward is when you come home you know, and you feel energized, you feel ready to, you know, you're pumped, you're ready to go to work or whatever. And then you go on with the rest of your day. So sometimes these routines are good within our life. To have a habit is not always negative. If it's a bad habit, then it's a bad habit, obviously. You want to remove it. But sometimes habits are good. Sometimes, as we'll see in this tradition from the 11th Imam, habits become bad. Habits become, rather than being something praiseworthy, they become more of a barrier to our connection to Allah. Right? Sometimes when we get into this fixation of ibadat, of worship, and it doesn't take on the right color, the right substance, the right thought pattern, that habit becomes more detrimental to us as believers, not only now, but also in the world to come. So how do we break out of this? What is the religious response to this habit loop? How do we break out of it for a believer who wants to try and change their perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 11th Imam, Imam al Asqari alayhi salam, shares the following hadith. And he says that, Laysat al ibadah, that ibadat or worship is not kathrat al siyami wa salat. Ibadat does not mean the copious amounts of fasting, how much fasting you do, how much you pray in the day. Ibadat, he says, is not about the quantity of your praying and fasting. Rather, he says, true ibadah, true worship, is that reflection, contemplation, the abundant thinking that you do about the commands of Allah. So here's what I say, and I will try to analyze this from a few different aspects, that sometimes we get into that rut, where we have a certain routine that we have to do. We have that cue, that trigger. For us, that cue is a calendar that's just going out. Right? We have the beautiful calendar, and we look at all the days in the month and we have different cues. Ah, Tuesday, du'a tawassal, there is a cue. The routine is go to the mosque, listen to the du'a, come back home. The reward, mashallah, I've done something good. Right? I felt energized, I felt charged. Right? 
That's why we have these programs. It's not because people are, you know, nothing else better to do, so let's just gather on a Tuesday. No, it's meant for us to gather as a community, to pray to Allah through the infallibles, to give us some more energy for the rest of the week. And then Wednesday comes, hump day as we call it. We're at work, things are going up and down. We finish Wednesday, Thursday, we look at the calendar. Ah, oh, Shabi Juma, we've got Dua Kumail, maybe we've got a Majlis, a Wiladat, or something happening. Another cue. So we get the kids ready from school, they have dinner, they get the change into some nice clothes, like the young boys here today. Like the young boys here today are dressed up for the Majlis. And the cue is we'll come to the Majlis, right? So the routine is we get in the car, we drive to the Majlis. We have some fun, we do some crossword puzzles, we'll have some chocolates at the end, have some tea, have some cake. That's the reward, right? And we get the reward of being in the presence of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, hearing the du'as, hearing Hadith Kisa, all of these things. And then the routine goes on and on and on. Here the Imam is showing us that that's obviously important. The Imam isn't saying don't do that. He's saying that don't consider this to be the only act of worship in our lives. Right? This is important. To pray is important. To come to majalis is ultra important. To take part in the majalis or programs where the du'as are being recited. You know, they're like boosts of energy. It's like when you have your cell phone and you're running on low, although you have the best cell phone on the market, but yet the battery seems to always lose battery life. So you'll charge it up, you'll go for a few hours, you'll charge it up again. Think of these majalis, think of the calendar of the jamaat as that battery, that, that battery pack. Right? You have Tuesday du'a tawassul. Wednesday you can take a break because the batteries are charged. Thursday is du'a, uh, du'a kumail. Friday you have the Jummah. If you can't make it for Jummah, then obviously you, you know, we have Saturday, we have the Sunday Fajr program. All of these things are to charge us up, to keep us going through the week. But again, that becomes sometimes a habit. Here the Imam is showing that the true essence of ibadat is not only these actions, it's to think about Allah, to think about how He works and functions in the world. And so as we look at worship, as a part of this discussion for tonight, we have to understand at least two different terms. We have ibadat, which is what we do, but you have two components of it. You have an abid, which is the worshiper, and you have the ma'bud, that which is worshipped. So when you have the worshipper, what is worshipped, you add it together and you have ibadat. But with this definition, keep in mind that everybody in this world is an abid. People in the masjid are abids. People in the synagogues, they're abids. People in the, in the, in the gurudwara, they're abids. People in the mall shopping, they're abids as well. People who are doing haram, they're abids. How are the abids? Well, an abid is literally one who worships. You can worship Allah, you're an abid. You can worship the dollar, you're still an abid. But the ma'bud, what you're worshiping is different. Allah says in the Quran, Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawa? Have you not seen that person who takes his lower desires, his passions as his God? He's worshiping himself. Right? You have TV shows, American Idol, Arab Idol. Right? These are the idols. So an, an abid is not only one who worships Allah. An abid can worship anything. Allah tells us people worship the devil. Allah talks about people who are abad al-taghut, people who worship Satan. Not that they prostrate, but whatever Satan wants them to do, their whims, their desires, they follow it. They don't follow Allah. So when we look at this definition of ibadah, we realize that everything in existence worships. But to come down to our level, we understand that we have, we have certain legislated forms of ibadah within Islam. Certain forms that are within the teachings. But are, again, keep in mind that Islam is not limiting ibadah or worship to only these. So praying is an act of ibadat. Fasting is an act of worship. Hajj, ziyarah, all of these become acts of worship legislated within the religion. But as, as we look at the definition, we can actually broaden that definition. And we can understand that anything which is done in the name of Allah to bring us closer to Allah is actually worship. So when the 11th Imam said in the hadith that I began with, that 
Ibadat is not only praying and fasting, it's also tafakkur, is to think on the commands of Allah. We realize that ibadat is not only this little shell that we look at. You know, it's not just going to the masjid. It's not just going for hajj. It's not just going for ziyarat. Many things can become an act of worship in Islam. And this is an example I've given to the youth before. You youth, for example, the young men, they have a basketball team or maybe a, a, a volleyball team or maybe they get together and play, I don't know, ice hockey. This, if it's done with the intention of wanting to unite together as a community, with that intention, it becomes an act of worship. So people who say those youth are out playing basketball and sports and they're not coming to the masjid, well, playing games is actually can be transformed into ibadah. Because ibadah is not limited only to this sphere of pr praying to Allah, of fasting, of charity. Many things that we do in our lives can be considered acts of worship. I mean, our ladies, our mothers, our wives, our daughters who maybe help around the house, maybe they cook, they clean, they do things around the house. If they're doing it with the intention to please Allah, that becomes ibadat for them. Or even the men, all of the things, whether we cook and clean, we do the dishes, these are all acts of ibadat. Yeah, it's a chore, but also Allah says that this is a form of worship of Allah. So when we realize that all of these things become acts of ibadah, that worship, then we realize that the words of the 11th Imam, that tafakkur, the thinking about the commands of Allah, are also a form of worship. And then we see that this, hopefully, in, at, at, the, at the first stage, can actually get us out of that routine, that negative habit of just relegating ibadah to, to certain actions that we do within the day. You know, certain trigger points on the calendar, or certain things that we think that we only can group or categorize under the topic of worship, when we look at it at a broader scope, we see that many actions, including again the words of the 11th Imam, become an act of worship for you and I. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. But as I mentioned that one of the problems becomes is when we get into a habit of doing certain things. The trigger points are, the, the cues are there, which is okay. The dates on the calendar we see, or the events, the Tuesday, the Thursday, the Friday, all of these events that we have, they're all within that habit that we might have formed. But one of the problems come, one of the problem comes is when all of these things, they leave this sphere of ibadat and become an adat. They become just an act that we have to do. They become a habit. Right? And I'm sure we've seen this scheduled many times before. If not in this format, we know in the emails, we know at home that this is the routine, how it has to be. Every community, every center on a Thursday, this is the routine. Right? It's like when you go to a restaurant and you look at the menu. You'll have your appetizers, you'll have the entrees, you'll have the main courses, the desserts, the drinks. And it's always in that particular format. You won't find a menu that really you know, has the desserts at the beginning. Right? You usually keep the dessert to the end. Maybe not a problem, but when you look at religion, Islam, and connecting to Allah, when you have such a checklist in our lives, it becomes a problem if that habit is only there for the purpose of a reward. Right? If the only reason why we come to a program, not here but anywhere, is the reward at the end, and the reward is a piece of cake, or a cup of tea, or, you know what, I finished my responsibilities, I've done something for Allah, or for the Prophet, or for the Ahlul Bayt, then this is where the challenge comes in, is that we've left the aspect of the spiritual, and we've gone towards the ritual. We've left the worship, and it became just a habit. right? Just like that person who jogs every morning at 5 a.m. He just does it out of routine now. Maybe it's for, the, for cardiovascular to feel better, whatever. But it's just a habit he's gotten into, or she's gotten into. And the challenge comes, as the Imam says, is that these are not acts of worship to be considered as, you know, that, that these are at the pinnacle. This is not the only form of worship as the Imam is showing to us. And so when we get into a checklist mentality of ibadat, then this is where the challenge comes, that is it being done out of the sincere worship of Allah? Hopefully it is, and every one of us, and every believer has to realize that for themselves, 
Or is it just to fulfill a requirement of a habit that I have become used to? Because since I was a little tiny baby, my parents brought me through this routine and we went through it day after day after day. And so the question which comes, the dilemma, which hopefully we'll try to conclude with the answer, is how do we go or how did we go as a community from worship to habit? And how do we somehow return back to our actions becoming a true sense of ibadat or worship of Allah, where we're doing it not just because it's something to do on the calendar, but because it is something which is going to hopefully bring me some better, betterment, both in this life and also in the life to come. If we want to maybe understand where the problem lies, where do we get to the state that we're in today, perhaps that this is the reason why, is that for many years, as believers, we were told not to think. You look at some of our great scholars like Ayatollah Jafar Subhani, one of the Maraja Taqlid today in Qom, an expert in Quranic studies, an expert on world religions, who's written a multi-volume work studying all of the different various religions and all the different groups within Islam, multi-volumes. He's an expert in many different religious areas. But when he writes a book in introducing the Quran and ayat which are difficult to understand, you know, because some verses of the Quran are difficult, right? Some verses you and I can read and, yeah, okay, that makes sense, right? Allah is talking about this and that and I can understand it. But certain verses are difficult. They are what Allah calls mutashabihat. They're allegorical. Ayatollah Jafar Subhani, when he looks at the Quran, in this introduction, he says that one of the maladies that hit the Muslim Ummah of the 21st century or of the 20th century was that we as a community were told that the Quran is only for the ulama. The layman, all you can do is memorize maybe a few passages, learn how to recite with tajweed, do the proper recitation, but don't think about the Quran. Why? Because we leave that to the ulama. Let the scholars think about religion. We'll just follow we'll become the sheeple of the society, right? We're just the sheep, whatever they say we'll do. And he even, he, he admits that this is one of the greatest blows to Islam, where people were not allowed to think about the Quran, right? Where we just came, we came to the month of Ramadan, we opened the Quran, read the 30 days, we close the book, throw it back on the shelf. And this became a fixation in many of our actions. Dua Kumail would come, we wouldn't understand it, but we just gather together to recite. Today, many of us, if we were asked, well, what is the content of Dua Kumail about? Right? Maybe we wouldn't know it, maybe word for word, but we might not even know passages of the Dua because it's only done in Arabic, which isn't our language. Right? It's only done in a foreign language. Maybe it's on the screen, the translation, but it's not heard. And sometimes if you take something in orally, through the ears, it's better than, you know, visual. For some people, maybe visual is better. But to hear it maybe in our mother tongue or in our language, it may bring more resonance into the heart. But we got fixated on this habit. Thursday night, Dua Kumail has to be Arabic. Hadith Kisa has to be Arabic. Surah Yasin, it's for the Marhumin, right? If I don't recite it, they'll get nothing from me tonight. Right? It's not like, you know, that Allah won't give them anything else, it's only that surah, that's the only chapter that Allah would reward. So khair, we took it, but we made it into a routine, into a habit, so much so that we can never break from that habit, and you try. We've seen in communities, you try to change one thing on the menu, and there's a backlash, people will say, I'm not gonna come to the majlis ever again because you've changed my routine. I always did surah yasin, hadith kisa, majlis, Ziyarat, food in that order, now you come and change things? How does that work? We've done this since back home, back in East Africa. This is how we did things. You can't change it. Right? But it got into a habit where we don't think about it now. We just become mechanized. We're like that little rat, getting the gift, waiting for the cue, doing the routine. And so let me share with us two verses of Allah showing us in the Quran that this religion is not just about routine. It's about thinking and actually exploring this religion and actually coming to an understanding through the beauty of the religion of Islam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So this verse is from Surah Baqarah, Surah number two. And the beginning of the verse says, Inna. 
I've hem- emphasized this word, and as the, the transition I put is as a matter of fact. Anytime you see inna within the Quran, realize that Allah is trying to emphasize something to you and I. Right? It's a point of importance Allah is using this, this, this word for inna, this particle. You know, it's... It's like somebody saying, you know, trying to get your attention, and so they're going to, you know, be very emphatic on something. You see this used so many times in the Quran. Inna ma yuridu Allah, inna, you know, uh, inna fi khalqi samawati wal arv. All of these ayat that begin with inna, Allah wants to emphasize something to us. So when you see this in the Quran, think about it and stop and think, okay, what does Allah want me to know? Why is He emphasizing this particular verse? You know, why not something else in the Qur'an? In this verse, Allah tells us six different things to think about. Six very unique things about, human, about nature, about the universe, about the world of creation. He talks about in the creation of the heavens and the earth. Inna fi khalqis samawati wal ard. Right? The creation of this earth, the creation of the universe. Not only that, but he says, and the... Night and day, and how they you know, go back and forth. You have this alternate alteration. Night comes, day comes, night comes. It's been going on for thousands of years. Allah says, think about this. Think about the creation, think about night and day. He says, think about these ships that carry things that you and I benefit from. And we see all of this cargo coming across the oceans with these massive containers. Allah says in the Quran, there's things on those ships that go on the ocean, that are carried, that you and I make benefit from. Again, Allah is showing us, think about these things. Inna, what is he wanting to get the point at? He says, think about the rain that we send from the heavens. It gives life to the earth, this dead earth, which after winter is completely decimated. Spring comes in March, April time. The rains come, the crops grow. It brings de- that dead life back to that dead earth back to life again. And then Allah says, What about the animals that crawl all over the earth? Right? And then he says at the end, even the clouds pass overhead and they send rain down. Allah says, think about all of these things. And then at the end of the verse he says, All of these are ayat, Likomin Yaqilun, for people who think, for a community who are thinkers. Right? Not just communities who come and open the Qur'an and read it or hear it on the PowerPoint and then go on with life. Right? Allah is saying that these are all things for us to think about. I mean, in fact, even Surah Yasin right, comes to my mind. Every Thursday we recite Surah Yasin for the dead. Correct? Every week we have the names of the Marhumin. Muki stands up here. He'll say 30, 40 names of all the Marhumin. We recite Surah Yasin for all of the dead. But actually, Surah Yasin, Allah says that this Surah, this Quran, is being revealed for those who are alive. In the Surah itself, man kana hayyan wa al al kafirin. The Quran is for those who are alive, not the dead. They sure they get the thawab, but Allah says in Surah Yasin that this is for the living. But again, when we do it as a habit, out of routine, as that ritual. We've lost that life, that becoming alive again through the beauty of Allah's words. So here Allah shows us these ayat, these are all ayatullahs. The, run, the rain, the sun, the clouds, the creation of the heavens, the, the planets, these are all signs of Allah for you and I to think about them, to reflect. Right? As the 11th Imam said, true ibadah is not praying a lot and fasting, it's tafakkur, it's to think on the commands of Allah. One other example we'll give from the Quran in terms of social issues, right? Because Allah talks about social issues also within the Quran. He talks in this verse in Surah 6, Surah An'am, don't associate partners with Allah. Don't engage in shirk. He talks about doing good to your parents, your mother, your father, whether they're alive or whether they're dead. We've talked about in the past how to honor your parents once they die, because still when your mother or father are in the grave, you still have to be good to them. And there is ways to do that. Allah talks about not killing your children out of fear of poverty. Abortion, people are worried, if I have too many kids, how will I take care of them? Certain parts of the third world, people have this concern. Allah talks about keeping away from acts of sexual indecency. 
in this verse. And he talks about don't commit murder or indiscriminate acts of violence, you know. But why does he do this? What is the reason for Allah to bring all of this? Is it just to give laws for us to do yes and no, do this, don't do that? Again, he says in the, at the end of the verse, لَأَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ That you may look at all of these. لَأَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ That maybe you'll read and think about all of these things and begin to reflect on more than just the words on the paper, but what is the system that Allah is putting into place? It's not just to read the ayat, not just to make a documentary about it, not to just make a poster in madrasa class. These are important, but ultimately is to think about the religion. Think about why we do certain things. Think about the Quran. Right? Think about why does Allah make use of references where we sometimes would think, well, why would Allah even bring that example in the Quran? Right? To reflect on the ayat and to realize that, you know what, we got to get out of that routine of this mechanization of robotic worship of Allah and to actually get into the worship of Allah, which is based on intellect, on understanding, on thinking things through, obviously through the support and assistance of the teachings of Ali Muhammad and those who have been given the knowledge, which is our ulama. Salwa ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So let me wrap it up and close in the next two minutes. Is to get out of that mode of the cue, the routine, the reward, and then it goes over and over again. Again, habits aren't bad. I'm not saying to break all the habits, but to re-energize ourselves, to realign our understanding of why we do a lot of these things, to understand what we do in these things, is to go back to the words of the 11th Imam, that he says that ibadat is not only a multitude of praying, is not excessive fasting. Worship, he says, is that continuous reflection and thinking about Allah's rules, about Allah's universe, about all of these things that he's put into the Quran, the way that Ali Muhammad explained a lot of these things to us in the hadith. All of these things, ultimately, when we begin to know Allah, begin to know our Creator, begin to know how He works, this will ultimately lead you and I to having a better sense of ibadat. Our worship will actually take on different forms, first of all. It will hopefully become a better quality of worship because we're better, we're better understanding Allah, we're better understanding his, his entire system He's put into place. And perhaps through that better understanding of the, quantity, the quality of our worship, perhaps the quantity may increase. Again, keeping in mind quantity not only in praying and fasting, quantity in thinking, reflecting on the Quran, reflecting on the message of Ali Muhammad, looking at the Imams and their legacy and their mission and their message. And when we put all of that together, when we, as we conclude, when we put that together of praying, fasting, all of those acts of worship, with thinking and reflecting and actually beginning to understand our religion not as a habit, not as a ritual, but as a spiritual phenomenon, then that hopefully will make that change within our lives, that we're able to increase in our proximity to Allah. Ultimately, for us, that means in our proximity to the Ahlul Bayt, which means, obviously, as the time of the Dhuhr of the Imam, when that arrives, that we will be in a better position to be amongst his helpers and his assistants, and obviously, at the end of the day, ultimately, a better position in Jannah, in Paradise, because we would have actually earned Jannat through an understanding, and not just as a phenomenon of worshipping Allah, as a culture, as a hand-me-down from our forefathers, but something that we truly understand and actually have taken through our own understanding, our, our thoughts, our reflection of this beautiful faith of Islam, that the 11th Imam brought and all of his forefathers brought for us. And so as we close, we ask Allah on this blessed night that he accept our acts of worship that we have performed in our lives. We ask Allah to give us the ability to learn of the teachings of Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah to be able to learn and understand the Quran. We ask Allah for us to be able to implement what we learn of the Quran into our day-to-day -day lives. We ask Allah to forgive us all of our sins, to keep us all on the path of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah for all of those in our communities, in our families, in our friends who are suffering any illnesses, any sicknesses. Many of us, I'm sure, have loved ones 
who are ill, maybe in a hospital, maybe at home. We ask Allah to grant them a recovery, a speedy recovery from whatever ails them. We ask Allah for those who have left this world to forgive them any of their sins, to pardon them and give them a place near Ali Muhammad in the Jannah of Firdaus. And we ask Allah last but not least to hasten in the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, and that we can be of those to help and assist and lead the way to pave the groundwork for the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, Ajjal Allahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta as-sami'ul alim. Let us close by reciting one salawat upon Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.